go. It's going to be a little different because I had one of my students do really, really, really well. And when I say really, really, really well, 300,000 in one year. And the student was married to a husband who was not financially prudent. They had a good 18 months and all that money's gone. And it wasn't like a net 300,000, but it was a gross and it created a lot of problems. And it just got me to thinking, and I've said this before, you know, manage your money or your money will manage you. But many, many people are not really taking that to heart. They're just not because regardless of how much money you make, you still have to handle it and manage it a certain way. It'll never, never change. And this is one of the new things that I'm doing for folks who come on time, because typically if I start at 2.59 and <laughs> the women are supposed to start at 3 o'clock, no one's going to be mad except for the late folks. So with that, I'm going to jump into it. Let me go ahead and pop this down. This is the way that I run my webinars. I will go ahead and go over the information. If anything that I say you have a question about, you can type that question into the question bar. I will answer it after the webinar and you can ask anything you want, anything that comes to mind, and then we will jump into it. So with it being 3 p.m., this is Glendon Cameron and welcome to Manage Your Money or Your Money Will Manage You webinar. With that, let's begin. This is one of the biggest fallacies that many people run into, that money is power and money is prestige. And no, it's not. Money is a tool. That's all money is. And as anyone that has held any type of tool knows, sometimes the tool is only as good as the user. So if you are not really skilled at using that tool, you're going to have problems. You're going to have some issues because think of this. Money is the thing that gets you in a position to do other things and to take care of your responsibilities in our Western society. Because if you don't have money, you don't have a place to live unless you're living with family or you have some special hookup. Money is a tool that is required. But when you think money is power, this kind of triggers some things that may create an internal conflict. And internal conflicts are huge. Internal conflicts are problematic. Internal conflicts create situations that can make your internal hard drive crash because when I say money is a tool, and if you think money's power, let me give you an example of how that can go wrong. If you think powerful people are inherently bad, and some people have that assumption, because to get to certain pillars of power, sometimes people have to do some bad stuff or play rough and tough. That's why I don't think any person can become the president of the United States without ingratiating themselves with people who may not have the country's best interests at heart. Republican, Democrat, well, it doesn't matter. You cannot get to that level without a lot of favoritism. I mean, it's just the way it is. So if you think those type of people are inherently bad and you think money is power, you are going to subconsciously think that money is bad. And what you subconsciously, not what you consciously think, not what you consciously talk about or claim that is good for you. It is the subconscious computer of your mind that runs the show. So you're saying, I want a lot of money. I want to live this certain lifestyle. I want to, but your subconscious mind's going, no, 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 no. Money's bad. Only bad people have a lot of money because money is power and power is inherently bad. So you create this mental loop that will circumvent your talents. You might even make a lot of money. Going back to one of my clients that went through this, fortunately for them, their business is robust. Fortunately for them. So I had to sit down with both of them 
and she's the prudent one. He's not. And he was just like, well, Glendale, Glendale, you know, money's to be spent. You know, you only live once. You know, we ain't never seen that kind of money coming this. It was just like, you know, I was like, dude, your business is good now. It doesn't mean it's going to be good next year or the year after or the year after. So understand that if you want to lock in the gains of a really good year, you have to put money away. And from what your wife told me, y'all are only making $50,000 a year together. So I can kind of understand why this blew your mind because you had more money than you've ever seen in your checking account. And it just went woo, wild with it. <laughs> I mean, he was making it rain, literally. So they went through that money. Fortunately, uh, she was on it. She paid the taxes. And the only bad consequence is they didn't get to lock in the wealth gains that that year could have produced. The second year was not as good, but they made money and they're on a plan because when you are poor and you've never, ever had any money, chances are high that you're going to floss because you have all of these years of desire and wants and you just you're in a position to get it and you just don't see nothing wrong with getting it and that's because of a lack of a financial education and i speak from experience because the first time i had a job that I did really well i was a crackhead i went out and bought a bmw paid cash for it i was like yeah i was sporting it driving around going over to my friend's house and i was stupid because the same money that i used to buy that car i could have paid cash for a rental house that I could still own today that would be giving me money year after year after year after year. And that's part of your financial education, because one of the things that you should do is what I call a money dream map. If you're married, do it with your wife and husband. If you're not, just do it with your son or maybe do it with your girlfriend or boyfriend. But sit down and go, if I got $100,000, what would I do with it? And just seriously think about it. You know, just really think about it because this exercise will blow your mind because everybody goes fantasy first, except for mothers and fathers who want to leave some for their kids. I've noticed that the people who do this, I can just like, oh, you're a father, aren't you? You're, yeah, because they're thinking of something bigger and better than themselves. So these are the amounts. You take $100,000, what would you do with it? $200,000, what would you do with it? $500,000, what would you do with it? One million dollars. What would you do with it? Five million dollars. What would you do with it? Ten million dollars. What would you do with it? Take all of those amounts, write them down and create dream map plans, because, see, this is this is something that's really, really cool about this exercise. When you do it, you expose what you think money is, because if you go through this exercise, and there is no savings account. There is no buying real estate. There's, I mean, because a hundred thousand, and this is money straight up hundred thousand. Tax is already paid. You get the full hundred thousand. Because one person was like, "Well, is this the hundred thousand after tax or pre-tax?" No, hundred thousand, two hundred straight money, no tax. Do this exercise, and it's kind of fun because it starts you to dream again. So sit down and just really go through that stuff. And just see where you are as a person. And it's, you know, it's a fun exercise. Per amount, take a sheet or sheets of paper if required. And just write down, what would you do with that money? And then just kind of wait a week and go back and look at the list. And see how much of that stuff you still you want. Because once you release that out of your mind, that, hey, I want this. And then you expose it and you put that in a situation where you actually see yourself having it. Some of these things that you want really bad or due to what I call thirst. It's just a thirst for what we consider the good life. But when you really think about it, a lot of that stuff, it ain't really, it ain't really what you want. But you've never been in a situation or in a position to really think about it and explore it because it's just pent up thirst. So 
that's a fun exercise to do. I'm, I, I tell everyone to do it. Just do it because you, you'll be blown away because, you know, and sometimes it's fun to do in a group because people are like I'm going to buy a yacht. I'm going to have me uh, some midgets serving coconut uh, flamingos. Yeah. I mean, it, it just gets really, really crazy. But remember, money is a tool. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, this is something that I had early on. If you've ever been in a position where you get money, it's got to leave your wallet as fast as possible. I mean, it's got to go. It's just like you get your insurance check or your tax refund or some type of estate windfall on Monday and maybe 10 to 50 percent is gone on Saturday. That's a problem. That's a problem. That just speaks to a lot of things that you're not getting and planning for. So I have a question for all of y'all. Does money make you anxious, happy, or scared? When many people win the lottery, they tend to nut up. Uh, recently, someone here in Georgia won like a huge amount and actually came out. But it's very interesting about this couple because there's a picture of them at their house. They already were doing very well financially. So they probably, and they're in their 60s. So they're at that point where they've managed a lot of stuff, put money away, and like I said, they live in a nice neighborhood, nice house. So they were already financially savvy. Now, if you heard one of my videos about how people do the lottery, you don't hear from them for six months because they're scared and they're anxious. These people won the money, came out because they already had a plan on how to handle the money because they're used to handling money. I want you to think about it. They came out, put pictures on the new everybody. I mean, seriously, because most people hide because they're scared. They're scared scared. So when you are comfortable with money, you don't feel anxious and you're not scared. You're happy. And it's not about how much money you have, because I learned this lesson years and years ago when I was in the medical field. I was working next to Cobb Hospital and it's this doctor office. And I was working for a company by the name of LabCorp. There was this girl in there. She was a nurse tech or a medical assistant. I don't know exactly what, because she did a lot of stuff. She came up with a new car one day. And I was like, wow, that's nice. She said, yep, got it yesterday, paid cash. And the girl was about, I, she was two or three years older than me. And I think I was 28 at the time, 27, 28. And I was like blown away because I was like, how did you pay cash for a car? I was literally blown away. And I was just like, I knew what she made. I made more money than she did. And I was just like, she didn't live with her parents. And I was just like, how? And then one, I mean, it just bothered me, man. I was just like, you know, and she was a smoker. So one day she was out there smoking and I just kind of slipped out when there was, because there was no one in the office. There was no one in the office and I checked the front and we had no appointments for an hour. So I was just like, this is my time to talk to her. I said, hey, you know, I'm going to be really personal because you were talking about you pay cash for your car and how would you do it? I mean, you know, are you independently wealthy? You, someone left you some money and she was like, nope, puff, nope. Puff, she said that her father, who did not have a high school education, made her start saving money when she was 12. He said, you're a kid. What you do is save half your money and you spend half your money. But, you know, you live in this house. I take care of everything. You sp you save. So since from the age of 12, she got in the habit of saving a lot of money. Because if you make 100 bucks and you save 50, that's a lot of money in when you compare and contrast to what the original amount was. So she had this habit of saving. And like I said, she was 30 something. So she had 18 years of savings and she just dropped it. She said, um, I don't save that much. But she says, you know, she was just like, you know, if you listen to Clark Howard, there's a few pay periods that are free and clear if you have a budget. And she says, I have a budget. So she says, those two checks go straight into my savings account. And she just, she said, she saved 30% of everything that she made. And I was just like, wow. And she she told me, she said she had about $96,000 cash in the bank after buying the car and after putting a big chunk down on her house. And she said, I almost paid the house off because I think she told me the house was like at the time. This was a long time ago. This was like 65, 75. But she said that would have put me in a position where I would have been house rich, but I would have had no cash. And she's like. 
And this is where I got some of these uh, expressions for like, fuck you money. That was she's the first person I never heard to use the word fuck. She said, you know, that's my fuck you money. Like if I don't want to come up in this job or someone pisses me off, fuck you. I can pay for my Cobra and I can live for a year. I can live for two years. I can live for three years. I can live. I can live a long time off the money I have. And this was money, catch money. But this was no 401k stuff which she was contributing to. So she didn't make a lot of money, but she started saving early. And she had very good money habits. This 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 is something that I struggled with for a long time, developing good money habits. I made a lot of money. I did really well in some things. And there was this period where I was like just totally ass out. And I realized talking to her, very few of us have talked about money at an early age. If someone sat you down when you were young and impressionable and this person that sat you down was someone you respected greatly because it couldn't be anyone. If you don't respect them, I don't care what they tell you. It's like, whatever, man. And she told me her father owned like six houses. The house that they owned, they lived in was paid off. This guy didn't graduate from high school, but he learned something that was very important. Delayed gratification. He learned that lesson well and he took he passed it on to his daughter, which gave me a new I tell you, when I got like 5,000 saved, I like, yeah, I got fuck you money, right? Because <laughs> I had never had $5,000 saved. It took me about a year to do it. And it changes you when you know that you have money somewhere. It kind of change. You're a little bit more confident. Your chin's out a little bit. And you don't take no mess at work because you know that you'll be OK. And that's one of the reasons when I did the, the video on YouTube where I said, Learn to save money. You know, try to, take, try to take a week where you don't spend any cash because all of this stuff is money habits. It's not how much you make. It is not how much you make. It is what you do with what you have. That is the that's that's the thing. It's what you do with what you have. So when I develop my money habits, I got to a point where I was saving a lot of money. This is what enabled me to write my first book. I tell you, yes, I lived on 1500 bucks a month, which was coming from a fat ass savings account. But if I didn't learn those money habits from this fuck you money, I don't know where I would be today. I mean, seriously, I have no clue because it's not how much you earn. It's what you do with what you get, because how you view and spend money becomes a seriously monkey around your neck. And the reason that I'm doing this for most of you who are hustlers, entrepreneurs, is some of you are going to hit big. Some of you are going to do something. You're going to create a product. You're going to do something on the web or your business is just going to blow up. And if you do not develop sound money habits now before you get the money, you're going to fuck it up. Which brings me to the B word. Budgets for billionaires. I was listening to this guy here in Georgia. I cannot remember his name, but... He created a company which he sold for something like $10 million in like the 80s when he was like 28. Yeah, he built this company, graduated from Georgia, and was like 21, 22, created this company, sold it for millions, and he put it into his portfolio. And he said he's had a budget all of his life. This notion of money ain't a thing and just blowing money fast is a fascination of rappers hip hop people and folks who don't really understand because when I read about a Damien Dash, someone I know that literally earned maybe a hundred million in his lifetime who's broke now, it was just the money was being spent and it wasn't being invested. If the kind of money that he was making, if he was buying a Bentley every year, if he invested 30% of what he's making, he still he'd be solid, right? He'd still be buying a Bentley every year. He was investing nothing. He was investing nothing. No, he was just blowing it. And when you get to that level where you know you're making millions a year, why are you financing property that's not commercial? It makes no sense. This is what these people do. So the budget is super, super, super important. And I recently I sat down with someone and I helped them with their budget. And they did the thing that everyone does is they give you the big bills. Here's the mortgage. Here's the car payment, blah, blah, blah. I was like, OK, what about your electric bill? Oh, yeah. What about your gas bill? Oh, yeah. What about your life insurance? Oh, yeah. For one uh, 
contributions. Oh, yeah. Uh, all this stuff. And then when I filled in all that stuff, it was like, whoa. They were like, this is my this is where my money goes. It's like you people focus on those big bills. And it's like I got the big bills paid because if you don't get the big bills paid, you don't have a place to live. You don't have a car to ride in. So their focus is there for a reason. But it's that other stuff that creates slippage. Like. You know, cable, I've seen so many people who are paying $180 to $400 a month for cable and satellite. And this is the thing that cracks me up. It's one person in the household. Well, you know, in case company comes over, I've got this the satellite dish and the receiver in this room, in this room, and there's one in the basement. There's one person living in the house between satellites, cable, cell phone plans. And I'm talking about one person. I'm not talking about family. I'm talking about one person. I have seen people spend anywhere from $400 to $600 on those two things per month. Per month. The average income in this country is like under $45,000. So out of this country of 310 million people, 160 make less than 50 Gs. And six grand, let's see, and six hundred dollars a month is seventy two hundred. Now seventy two hundred dollars, that's a huge percentage of that money on two things. So when you do your budget, you got to do what I call two budgets. You got to do your current budget, and you got to do what I call your oh shit budget. And once again, like with the game, this is a real game. It's like okay, oh shit, what happens? What gets priority and what gets tossed? You got to do that. I've been through that. It's like, okay, I got to pay this, got to pay this, got to pay this. And this can go to the win. And I, that's one of the reasons that I don't have any department store credit cards. All I have, Visa America Express, um, MasterCard. I, there, if you become financially savvy, there is no reason for you to have a store credit card unless... They have an extended zero percentage rate for 14 to 20 months. You buy something, pay it over time. That's like paying cash. That's cool. But having them and constantly using them at 22 to 30 percent interest rate is robbing you of a lot of money because most people don't pay them off every month. You know, you hear this. Pay, you know, I have situations where I have certain credit cards I don't pay off every month because I use for business. And I'll tell you exactly how I do it. Recently, Discover had 14 months, zero percent interest. I got one that did some shit on it and I'm paying it off per month because I don't have to blow my cash because I can I'm making the money to pay it and I'm not robbing from my savings account or other things. The money to pay off that debt is actually coming from the business, but I'm paying zero percent interest and I have exactly 12 more months to pay it and I've got like 40 percent of it knocked out. You can play the credit card game right if you have good credit. If you don't have good credit. You're going to the credit card game is going to play you because uh, there was something else to happen. I got a chase card because they had like freaking 50,000 points for a trip for just getting the card. You know, you spend 3000. You can't play those games if you are living on the edge because your credit score is going to be decimated because you're always maxed out. This once again comes to having a budget. This once again comes to having discipline because uh, there's a guy who's another client who's in the Hustler Mindset Project. And I may have him on the Hustler Profiles. I don't know if he's going to come on. But dude had, he's knocked out maybe 42% of his student loan debt within a year. 42% with close, it had not been a year. It hadn't been a year yet. By the time it's a full year, he may have knocked out 50% of that stuff. That's life-changing and powerful because that stuff will haunt you forever. So he's knocking it out. And the reason is he's got a financial plan. He's got a budget and he's got direction because you can make a lot of money and still be broke because there's no plan. There's no there's no philosophy. There's no goals. There's nothing except BMF, bitch. No money fast. I mean, it, it's fun to spend money. It is. And I will say that I'm in a very unique position that of being in the storage auction business for so long that I don't have thirstitis. You know, I don't have to have new stuff. I mean, I was getting stuff all the time that, to the point it just got desensitized to getting stuff. It's like, oh, it's just stuff. 
But, you know, that was a rare experience that many people don't get to have new dining room tables. I mean, yeah, every year if you want one. I mean, from units. So understand you have to create a budget. I don't care if you are a student in college and you're working part time. You still you need a budget more than anyone. If you are 60, you need a budget. If you're everyone needs a budget and it's a concise budget with everything on it. And then when you look at it. Every few months, you should ask yourself, what can I get rid of? I got rid of cable because I don't watch television. It kind of sucks <laughs> with your ESPN because sometimes I don't get good games. But it didn't make sense for me to pay that money to have that cable stuff for just a limited time when I didn't. I mean, my television has not come on this week because I've been really busy. My television has not come on this week because I got so much stuff to do. So you got to ask yourself, why do I have this gym membership to a place I never go? Why do I have all these cable channels? Why do I have three phones and it's just me and I don't have a business? That kind of stuff keeps you poor. If you have a business and you need three phones, it makes sense. But if you're just having three phones because she's like, oh, these people are going to call me on this phone. I would say Google Voice, which is free and you can have as many numbers as you want. And they go to that phone or to an email address. But the budget, the B word is huge. Everyone needs a budget and everyone needs to go over it every few months and groom it, turn it up, flip it up, rub it, smack it, do all that stuff so that they can have a life of freedom. Now, this is something else that you do after the budget, because many people try to do it before the budget. And the problem is when you're trying to build wealth and you don't have a budget, Anytime you have a life crisis, you rob from your wealth building strategy because you have to. You can't keep money where you need to. Want. And oh, yeah, the guy that knocked out his uh, student loans, like 40 some percent of student loans, has maxed out his Roth IRA. Yes, that's strong. So once you get the budget, because you cannot <laughs> do this before you get the budget thing, because even if you get a lot of money, even if you win the lottery and you don't do the budget, you can still end up broke and poor. You got to ask yourself, and this is after the budget, how much of your money makes money. And when I'm talking about money, I'm not talking about stocks and bonds. Well, well this is a hustler mindset project, right? And we're hustlers. How much of your money do you have out there making you money, buying product, buying service, doing something? How much of your money that you make that you put out into the world? to create a product, service, or something to bring back more money. Essentially, how many of your dollars are going out into the world and grabbing more dollars and coming back home? If the answer is zero, that's a problem. And I'm going to tell you why, because if I can get this guy, his name is Andrew McAfee, a friend of him on Facebook, and I'm still trying to build a relationship. If I can get him on the spree cast, what's going to happen with the new economy is going to rock the world of a lot of people. It's not going to matter if you have a PhD. It's not going to matter... The only thing that's going to matter is if you're already independently wealthy or you already got a lot of money stacked, you'll be good. But there are many industries that are being disrupted. My sister is an attorney and someone posted in the Hustling University group about what was happening to attorneys. And you remember her talking about it because she went to a top 20 law school. She did very well. And her first few years as an associate just literally sucked. I sent her the article and asked, like, agree or disagree? And she said, agree. And then she put, did they take this from my journal? Now, my sister is better off than a lot of the people because she had some money from another source. So she's not as hammered as the average person who was an attorney. Now she's working for this consulting company, doing something that makes her much happier. But she still got her, her license. And, I mean, she still uh, passed a bar in three different states and she still keeps that up. Because, you know, she said she may open up a shingle and start doing some stuff on the side. But that business was disrupted by legal Zoom. You know, you're back, you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to do a will, you had to go talk to an attorney. Bam, 500 bucks, 600 bucks for him to sit down and write some stuff on the paper. If you wanted to do it in corporation, bam, 500,000, 1,500 bucks for ink, maybe 2,000, maybe 5,000, because they were in possession of knowledge that most people didn't have. They knew the law. They knew how it worked. They knew what they had to do. You had to use an attorney unless you were an autodidact who really knew how to read, study, and absorb information. So LegalZoom and other um, internet-based things 
has totally decimated the legal profession. I've dated attorneys. A lot of them do not make a lot of money. Unless that you know, you see the ones with the, the fancy cars, nice big houses, the partners, those people usually were top five percent of their law school and they got on that track or they graduated from the right college. If you're going to be an attorney, graduating from the right college is huge because there is a, a network from the college to certain corporations. It's just you ain't getting in if you didn't go to that school. Or you may get in, but you're not getting to a certain level without that pedigree. Not going to happen. So understand, do you have a plan for obtaining wealth? When I say wealth, go back to Miss Fuck You Money. She, she, you know, this was years ago. What she told me between what she had in the bank and her two cars that were paid off, the girl had probably a net worth of 150000 at that time. She was probably 31 or 32 which would make her damn near 50 something now. I wouldn't be surprised if that chick was worth half a mil. And this is another thing about the wealth thing. And, you know, I put on a video that's going up on YouTube about will you ever retire? That chick back then was closer to retirement at 32 than many people are at 60 because she was in a position to pay off her house. She already had good money management habits and she didn't have any debt other than a mortgage. So based on the fact that if she worked a regular job and got chump change from Social Security because she did so many of the right things in her life, she'd be fine. She would be fine. So this whole thing that you got to have a million dollars to retire. No, you don't. You got to have a plan. If you want to have traditional retirement. Pay off as much stuff as you can early, not when you're 60 or close to 60, get that stuff done. Like, give you a quick thing that I taught some people of mine, a friend, few friends of mine, a few years ago. Um, they both make 100000 a year. And I was like, with the money y'all make, you shouldn't have car notes. And they were just like, well, every, no, 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 no. YouTube clock, 200 k a year. The most expensive car. For regular people, I'm not talking about Bentleys and stuff. I mean, shit, take it there. You could you could buy a BMW X5, a Porsche Cyan. These are like hundred. You could buy that if you saved up or pay it off. If you took one salary and just paid it off over a year, you shouldn't have car notes. So I talked to him and I said, "Look, do this. Live on one income for a year." And they did it, and they realized. $60,000 savings. That's the most money they ever had. Very intelligent people. They were like blown away. They were blown away. So understand, even if a high income, you can put away a lot of money. You can put away a lot of money in low income. So they took that money and bought some rental property, paid cash for it. Did it again, did it again, did it again. Like I said, we're up to like eight rental properties. They're all paid off. And they keep they, they keep doing it. They both have their jobs. And do, do you understand in 10 years where they're going to be? They're going to be millionaires, um, real style millionaires, because the houses are paid off. So only thing they have is property tax and, and you know, upkeep. They don't have previous. They got renters in there. They got Section 8 people in some and regular renters and others. You see what I'm talking about? That's a wealth plan. So if you are trying to make money and you're married, you got to bring your partner on board. They have to be on board because it's just creating a problem. Just going back to the example of some of my clients that had that great year and her husband just went. <laughs> I'm balling, bitch. I mean, seriously, it was just she said he was going to the club buying drinks for everybody. I was like, damn. <laughs> and they didn't have. And that's the that's reason for this webinar. Just heard this, her story and I started it and I really slacked off. But. As an entrepreneur, you start you have to start putting some money away. If you're making a lot of money, the more money you're making, the more money you should put away. Because, you know, even if you have a better year, you should put more money away. Because I can tell you from experience, when you have robust resources, you can weather a lot of shit. You really can. Certain things just don't bother you anymore. 
you start doing goofy stuff like leaving your iPad, your phone. Because you ever wonder why people do that? You think they're for forgetful? No, they, they live a life of abundance. You don't worry about losing shit when you know you can replace it like that. But when you lose shit and it's going to be weeks, months, and it's going to be a lot of struggle and stress to replace, you hold on to stuff. So just you don't believe me? Go to a wealthy neighborhood or you know a mall that's of an affluent suburb and just walk around and notice how many cars are unlocked it will blow your mind that's why so many every year it's like yeah you know someone broke into my car you see people leaving their purses their ipads iphones just right there because they are live they, they know they can get that shit back it's a totally different mindset so as you develop a plan of becoming an entrepreneur you need to develop a plan of building wealth you need to be doing both because in the new economy, with all these things that are going on, you don't have to spend the kind of money I spent when I was in the storage auction business to get the same returns or better. You don't have to do that anymore. Not in this new economy. It is eerily exciting, but I'm a little pissed. <laughs> I was saying, I'm a little pissed. I was like, I went through all that shit, and now you don't have to do that to get the same money or even more? Ah, but that's the reality. So I'm telling you this because I have faith in y'all that many of you can get to that point where you're making a lot of money. And by doing the right, making the right decisions now with the money you're making, you'll make even better decisions when the money gets larger. Because I want you to be successful. I want you to have money. I want you to stack money. I want you to look in your bank account and freaking giggle like a kid. Like, come here, Ma, look at this. <laughs> we got money, baby. I want people to feel like that. I want you to not be worried about money. And part of worrying about money is proper fiscal allotment. It's not how much you make. I'm telling you, I, I told someone, on, I put on YouTube, $2,000 cash solves 90% of the emergencies that will pop up in your life. If not 99 point something, because you gotta think, how often does this $5,000 thing happen other than medical stuff? Just think about it. Think about in your life in the last five years, how many things happen that you needed five G's? Now, if you have a house, that's a different ballgame. You need to have a savings account with five to 10 G's in it anyway, if you have a house. But just regular living, think about it. Doesn't happen that often. I'm not saying that it, it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen that often. So develop those plans. If you're an entrepreneur, get yourself a Roth. And I'm going to tell you a little way that you can get you a Roth, get you a SEP and work this thing out where you get to keep both so that's a little later but get that stuff going now here is the hard part change with money is hard it's, i'm not going to sit here and say it's going to be easy that you can get this done really quick fast in a hurry nope nope nope, nope. what i'm telling you is it's going to be hard but it's going to be worth it that's what I'm telling you. You're going to have to go through a metamorphosis, you know, of how you deal with money, how you view money, how you handle money now to a different you. And one of the things that I learned from the gym is an inch of progress is still is, is still moving forward. You, you got to start looking at this it. like, hey, I moved an inch and you got to you got to do the happy dance. You got to do the I ain't the daddy dance that they do on the Mari Povich. It's like, hey, there's an inch. Do your little dance. Get up, kick your heels, whatever. And learn to get excited by success. Small success, medium success, and large success. So what I want you to do is do your budget today if you don't have one. If you have one, <laughs> bravo. If you don't have one, I want you to do one today. I want you to do what I call the full Rudy from the from the ruler to the to the budget. Everything, including the ditches, the kitchen sink. That money on your check stub that, you know, that just comes out of your check before you see it, that needs to go on your budget sheet because it's your money and it's still going somewhere to serve you. So it needs to be on your budget so you can accurately look at your money. So everything, how much money you spend on gas, how much money you spend on gum, how much money you spend on twerking, all twerk money, twerk, all that goes into your budget, all of it. And then once you get the, your line on budget should be like, you know, if you're a person like 30 something, you got kids, that's just 15, 20, 30 lines because you got stuff. Cable goes on there. Cell phones go on there. Get all everything. And then 
for a lot of people, it gets scary because when you do your budget and you add up all your bills and you add up your income, you're like, I got a hundred bucks left over a month after I pay my bills. And now that's why you're broke because you didn't know where your money was going. Not because of how much you made, it's because you didn't know where it was going. So understand, change is hard, but I want you to begin today. So that concludes the webinar situation, and I'm going to open up for questions, and there are questions already. Let's see. Uh, I will go with number one from Isaiah. I am starting the online reselling with only a few dollars and a low income. How do I get as much sellable inventory without much funds? I live in Georgia. Number one, make Craigslist your bitch. Uh, you're in the hustle you go to the resale tab and there's this automated service that you can use to source stuff from Craigslist. You want to get as much stuff as free. I'm going to give you an action plan right now. Sit down and create a list of all your friends and family, everyone that you know and that likes you. And then you go to everyone and this is, this is going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And you're just like, look. I'm doing this new reselling thing. Do you have anything in your house that you don't want? And for me doing that, if you have me I'm a chore or you need me to do something like cut the grass or whatever, I will give you a pass or an I coupon in the future where I'll come over and do that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, you got if you have nothing, you got to start with whatever you can get. So once you create that list and go talk to everybody and I'm talking about and you got to like talk to them. It's like, hey, you got any clothes in the basement? And then you got to go even further. Hey, do you know anyone else that has some stuff they don't want? Uh, one of my students used this technique and came up on a house full of furniture that was being foreclosed on. And the people just left that shit and said, bye. And he went in there because he had the key, clean that sucker out and came up on six G's. I'm telling you, because he asked enough questions of people. It's hard asking people because a lot of people like that. Well, you know, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I ain't going to beg nobody for nothing. That's the wrong way you look at it. You're looking at asking and offering. Because, see, if you offer to do something for them, it's not begging. It's quid pro quo. You're trading something for something. And hit Craigslist. Look at the free section. And then this is really going to be not so novel. Get a part-time job and use all of that money for your hustle fee. You know, you can still hustle. I mean, you you got to look at it like this. And I'm speaking to you from when I was living in the boarding house. When you have low income, it's almost like you don't deserve the party, if you know what I'm saying. It's like, okay, I don't have a lot of money, but I want to make more money. I'm not happy with the money I'm making. So you have to use your time to get more money, which means you may not be able to go out. You may have a situation where you're working seven days a week for six months. But if you have a plan, like say you get a part time job, a part time job gives you three fifty a month. And your plan is you got the budget and the plan that three fifty goes straight to savings. So in the end of six months, you got two G's. You don't have to borrow. And since you got a budget, some other stuff comes up. You might have more because you might find more money out the fat. So that's my advice on that, because. You can buy stuff and flip it and reinvest the profits, but it goes back to the budget and to the discipline. Uh, from the same person, Isaiah. <laughs> Do you have any tips for getting free tape above a wrap for shipping? Um, that's a hard one. I don't know where you can get free tape. The only thing I know is you can get free boxes from stores. The tape, I can't help you on that one. Uh, question three from Isaiah, when should I incorporate? How much should I have in profits before incorporating? Forget about incorporating until you balance out your financial situation. And for the following reasons, when you start a corporation, you become on the radar and you have to fill out paperwork. You can start an LLC here in Georgia for cheap, but what's your plan for it? You know, I, this is my philosophy. Start the business first start generating money and then incorporate unless you're doing some kind of partnership where you have to incorporate but for reselling get the money first and get as much as you can and get yourself uh, a war chest before incorporating because you know incorporations are and you know llc's are great inks are great 
but you got to have a plan because once you enter into that, certain expectations from the government are there for you that I don't think you need right now. Uh, this is from Deb. I knew a guy who received 500000 in two years. He called a friend of mine asking for a labor job doing carpentry. He blew half a million dollars. He didn't even have his house a car paid off, not even a pot to piss in. I mean, I've seen that. That's what I'm talking about. I've seen that because people have never gotten the right financial education. I have seen that. And it's scary because if they had took half that money and just put it in some fund, they would have had more money. Or if they bought some houses or even if they bought, went crazy and paid cash for everything, they still would be better off than they are now. That happens a lot. Uh, that was journal. This is none related. Not today, but possibly tomorrow or this weekend. Uh, the Enterprise. Roth RI and SEP at the same time. How? It's kind of twick. It's kind of tricky. It's tricky. When you create an ink, and this is not for, you know, you create a corporation an ink, you can put yourself on as an employee. This is where you need an accountant. Let me say that again. This is where you need a good accountant. This is not something I recommend that you do on your own because it gets tricky. So the Roth RA and the SEP is like two things. Okay, you have a job. You have your corporation and you work for your corporation. That counts as a job. So that gives you the ability to, to do the Roth. But so when you take your corporate income, that counts as business income, and you can put that towards your SEP. But this has to be structured. You need an account. You need to do it the right way. And you have to structure it from the inception of your company. You have to talk to someone. So, or, or you can, another way you can do it, you have a job, one corporation where you have a job. You have another corporation that you just own and money passes through it. Okay. Enterprise and Jacob. Yeah. It's a little tricky, but you can do it. Because a Roth IRA and a self-employment pension, all right, let me, this is where I let me or I say I'm not your financial accountant, but this is where when you have different companies and you have different sources of income, you open yourself up to taking advantage of different things out there. Now, if you have one company and it doesn't make a lot of money, this gets challenging. But say you have two companies. One company makes 500,000 a year. The other company makes, say, a million. And say company B, you're listed as a principal, a non-active principal. And there's other people doing the work. So that comes across as passive income. Once again, get an accountant. That's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, here's another question from Isaiah. How is that Amazon GPS windshield link doing under your videos? I'm thinking of buying link space from blogs and some other YouTubers promote ref links for they would get me to some free phone service that I can use for retail arborage missions. Uh, I put that link there as a test. It's really not doing that well because a lot of people don't know if you when you're doing YouTube, when you put links under your video, the first link gets the most juice. So it, it doesn't do that well. I would really, you are better off doing your own thing than trying to buy link space. The link space, the, the making money from affiliate links is a lot of people do it. And there are a lot of people that do it well, but it's like, to me, you, you need to know that game very well. You need to know that game very well. It doesn't sound like you do, and I'm not trying to be mean, but I think you need to work on your budget. I think you need to work on reselling and getting to a certain level. Because the thing is, when you start doing all of this stuff, like, you know, you're doing reselling, you got a job, you get a part-time job, it, it kind of gets diluted. You know, you, you got to sit down and say, what's the most important thing for me? Then two, what's the second most important thing? Then three was the third most important thing if you know and you gotta go through that list uh 
Uh, this is from Journal. Do you believe in the 10 10 80 rule regarding income? 10% savings, 10% donate, and live off the other 70% of the income? Absolutely not. Uh, don't believe in that at all. I believe in our current economic climate, you should do two things make as much money as you can and save as much money as you can. I'm thinking 20, 20 to 30 percent. I'm not a person that tithes, so I'm not in that religious sector, so I can't really speak on that. But I think you need to save at least 20 percent of your income for you and what you want to do with the other 80 percent that's on you. But yeah. <laughs> Y'all are like right behind each other. Do you recommend the percentage of income to put in savings? Um, minimum of 20. Per Let's talk about that because that's a loaded question. There's savings. There's investments. I think everyone needs to have five G's in a savings account. That's not in your 401k, Roth, whatever. That's 5,000 straight up savings if I need to get some money. After you get to 5,000, then put some other money other places because the thing with the six months living expenses, if you have a life that goes pretty well, a lot of times things don't happen. Once you have a budget and once you're on top of your money, uh, certain things get better. But I would say 5000 there if you have a family, 15000 And that's straight savings. Nowhere else. No 401k straight savings. Then other money goes into investments. I'm giving you dollar figures because the percentages can't work for everyone. And you can have, say you have two families, husband, wife, they both have kids. You've got one couple, they make together 80,000. You got another couple together, they make 30. They can't put the same percentage in. Uh, the couple with 30 really has to be very careful. So it goes by dollar amount to, in my mind. Uh, other people may disagree with me, but once you get to, Anyone that gets to like 20 grand cash somewhere, you're better off than 95% of the nation in terms of having cash on hand. You're better than 95% of the nation. And like I said, unless you have some catastrophe, you're good to go. And then if you've got that kind of money put away and you're handling your money, then you can buy uh, disability insurance. You can there's, there's a lot of products that can help you, but the first thing is to get your basic budget together. Yeah, this is journal. Yeah, I never use a debit card because they, there's more protections with credit cards. And when things go bad with debit cards, I've heard some horror stories of people could not get their money. But if I can get an account that I know, because I've got some people online up for Spreecast to explain the raw, because there are people out there who have a job, right? And they also have a company. So they have two different sources of income that titled or assigned like it's earned income it's like you have your job income you have your w-2 then you have a business you you know it's it's that kind of thing it's, you got to have more than one thing going on and like i said you can list yourself as an employee for your company but you got to do that from day one how it's set up how you list it who you talk to why you're doing it is extremely important and that's why i say get professional help or do a lot of research before you do anything. So, are there any more questions? We are at the 3.51 minute mark. If there are no, no more, let's see. Oh. Uh, here's Jacob. He says he's got his Roth through Vanguard for free, easy, and painless. Uh, journal, I'm not that religious. I asked about donating because Damon John from Shark Tank was talking about the methodology where if you donate money, it finds its way back to your life in some other way versus being selfish and conniving. I agree with that to a certain point that if you put money out and circulate it, it does come back to you. But I don't think it has to be in the form of donations to a church or some charity. You can put money in the economy by investing in a company that's starting up. Or There's a lot of ways you can circulate money. So I, I do agree with that. Uh, the enterprise at one point you were doing a credit series. Is that still on? Yes, I'm going to do that again. It's uh, the new for format for Hustle University is one big block of information, which for this month is resale. The next webinar is going to be on resale this Monday. 
and maybe 20% on other stuff because I was trying to be better with this because the way I was doing it was good, but it was not as good as it could be. So I'm trying to make this as best as possible. And that way, when the blocks are done and then new people join Hustle U, bam, there, there it is. And if I have to tweak it, I can tweak it. And over a course of a year, I have all these modules that can help people versus doing this, doing this and killing myself. <laughs> putting these things together is not easy and it's very time consuming. And I want to give you good information, but the credit series will be coming back uh, probably later on. Uh, if you set up a court, this is from Casey. If you set up a court, can you set yourself up as an independent contractor who gets a 1099? I am thinking no, but I've never done that. I'm giving you just, I'm thinking no, but if you talk to an accountant or, or a incorporation person, they may have a different answer for you. So that's my fancy way of saying, I don't know. I don't know if that can happen. But see, this is the thing about, you know, my favorite saying, don't hate the player, don't hate the game, learn the rules. There are times that you think you can't do something. When, when you get the right information, you find out, oh, yes, you can. Knowing how our country works and the rule of law is so important on so many things. So actually talk to someone and find that out because you might be able to do it, but you might not. Uh, the enterprise. Do you tip? And if so, how much? Typically, yes, I do tip. If I'm like a regular place like Waffle House and the bill's 10 bucks, I'll do $3. If I'm in a really nice restaurant and, it's, and it depends on the service. If the service is booty, I'm going to do 10%. If the service is exceptional, I'll do 30%. You know, between 20 something and 30 or something percent. So it really depends. There's no set formula for me is really based on how well the service is and even if the service is crappy i still leave something because i know other people have tip pools so you may have this one person jacking it up for everyone else oh thanks for the advice uh, i prefer to donate out of kindness versus expecting return however it's morally wrong for me to put for me to get receipts from homeless shelters when i don't to donate items to my taxes i don't know if that's morally wrong if they offer a receipt because I took my receipts from Goodwill. You better believe it. Can you own a corp and be an employee in your own corp? Can you be the only employee? Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. There's a lot of things you could do with a corporation, which are beyond the scope of this talk. But uh, yeah, you can do that. I'm going to see if there's any more questions. Uh, Deb, thanks again for the info. Sure thing. There will be more on this because uh, after this, I'm going to do like another workshop on how to do the budgets and stuff because I talked to some friends recently. Who, like I said, they're very smart and they didn't know how to do this. And both of these people have graduate degrees. And it was like, huh. So, yeah, there'll be more on this. Uh, journal, how much money did it take to start self-publishing? Uh, 185 bucks. Uh, when I did some other stuff, my total outlay for the first year, first few months was 265 and that was my money. And then the money that came in, I used for other things. So to get started, about 285 uh, The Enterprise, C Corp, C Corp or LLC? Once again, it depends on what you're doing. Uh what I know is like, say at some point you want to sell shares in your company, you're going to need an ink to do that. Uh, limited partnerships have limits because this is why you got to figure out what you're going to do and then figure out the entity that's going to work for whatever you're going to do. Because it's like an LLC can cover a lot of stuff. But if you know that someday you may want to like sell some of your company to a friend, you can do that with an ink very easy bam here's some shares boom sell them and cash out of your company llc not so easy <laughs> have you ever noticed that all the fortune 500 companies most of the time are inked there's a reason and i have to start another llc and uh, talk to someone because things change things change so i'll talk about that but once again, I'm like trying to keep on these big topics and, you know, 80% on one thing and like 20% on all this other stuff. So, but there's a lot more coming.
And I'm going to make a note here that people want information on corporations. And I'll see if I can find a corporation specialist. Let's put this down. Look for... Because I know enough to be dangerous. But whenever I feel that I'm getting in over my head, I don't have no compulsions about asking someone for help or hiring someone. None. Because whenever you do these corporations, then a lot of stuff starts to happen. And you get on the radar of a lot of people. That's why I'm saying figure out your game plan first before you incorporate anything, before you feel... Do all your groundwork first. So I'm going to look up a corporation specialist and do some more research. Because like I can sell up an LLC pretty easy because a lot of my stuff doesn't have buildings, vehicles. You know, I don't have all that stuff, so I'm not really worried. And uh, apparently a lot of people want information about corporations because... This is the beautiful thing about living in the United States of America. You could have as many corporations as you want. And as a guy, I need to get on because we talked and he was talking about holding companies. You create this one corporation that's a holding company and all the money from these other things pass through that holding company. The holding company never holds any property or anything. It's just strictly for cash. So the way that he explained it to me was very provocative. But I, I talked to him and I was like, you know, I really want you to come on my show. So if I can get that, that'll be cool. Uh, this is a great question from Jacob. Does your business have a credit score separate from your personal credit score? Yes, it does. If you choose to establish it, like it's called a paydex, and then there's other things. But with Dun & Bradstreet, it's called a paydex. And after you do a few things, you automatically get a score. You can do things to groom it. But yes, there's two distinct scores. If your business credit score is high enough you can buy cars, rent stuff, and get American Express. Used to be with no personal guarantee. Uh, typically, if you have a corporation that's 10 years old, you can do a lot of stuff. If it's 20 years old, you can get the world. Uh, no, I did not send out the link for the next webinar yet. Here's Journal. I personally want to thank you for changing my philosophy on money. I was able to weather many financial storms over the past year without borrowing money or being late on my bills because I took of your advice from managing my money. Dude, that's freaking awesome. That's freaking awesome. I'm glad to do it. Man, keep doing what you're doing. Are there any more? Oh, hold on. I do not have any videos or webinars on business versus personal credit, but I'm going to do that. Uh, personal credit, it's, it, business credit, let me just give you one big warning. Business credit does not have the financial protections of personal credit. So when you sign on with this stuff, there is no really getting out like you can with a credit card. Like you can go out and charge up a ton of credit cards, file bankruptcy. Actually, there's no getting out of that either right now. Uh, they changed the bankruptcy laws. But the uh, the thing is, if you do it right, say, give you an example, and I did this. I had two trucks in business credit name and nothing on my personal credit. If you, It's a way that you can get vehicles and stuff, if you know what you're doing, and it not go on your personal credit. Like, say, you want to buy a new vehicle, right? But you're getting ready to buy a new house, and you know that's going to screw up your ratios. If you buy the vehicle under your corporate credit, it never appears on your personal credit report unless you default. And then because they're going to get you with a personal a PG or a personal credit, uh, personal guarantee. At that point, it will pop on your personal credit, but not before. So it's a way to hide debt that, you you know, you still got to pay it, but it doesn't affect your credit score. OK, it's 402. I am going to shut this puppy down. Uh, I will do another one of these because I, I can tell people want to hear about it. So I will do that. And uh, for those who are in Hustle University, once this is processed, I will put it up in one of the in the file section. All right. Uh, let's see. Is this insane and outdated to still save coins in the piggy bank because they helped me throughout? No, any way that you can save is a good way. I don't care if it's piggy bank. I don't know. Any way that you can save is awesome. So with that, that being the last question, I'm going to be out and. Uh, Sure. No problem. So like, let me just say thanks for everybody that came out this afternoon. I appreciate it. And I will see you on the good side.